Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley. And we are very privileged to have with us this evening Grant Palmer. He is uh, retired from the LDS church education system, and he is the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Uh, before we get started this evening, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite you to worship with us at Christ Presbyterian Church in Magna, Sunday mornings. Uh, Sunday school is at 945, worship is at 11. That's at 8630 West, 2700 South. We also have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian, that meets at 3350 Harrison Boulevard at 9 a.m. in Ogden. If you'd like more information on our church, you can go to gospelutah.org or give us a call at 801-969-7948. But as I mentioned, we have with us Grant Palmer, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Now, I want to focus <coughs> this evening primarily on uh, the article that you've written about Joseph Smith and polygamy. But before we get into that, for, for folks who don't know who you are, can you give us just a sort of a thumbnail sketch? Uh, I was a member of the LDS Church uh, all my life. Uh, five, six generations of uh, Mormon on all sides. Uh, taught for the uh, Seminary and Institute program for 34 years. Uh, um, live here in Salt Lake City, have uh, four children, 13 grandchildren, and uh, just enjoying my retirement. So now you're retired from the church education system, but as you started studying some of these things, you began to see that uh, there was more to it than you had been told before, wasn't there? Well, that that's true, and it's especially in the foundational claims, uh, uh, I don't think LDS people realize that they haven't been uh, informed about uh, the rest of the story, so to speak, and uh, this would be on... Uh, that's what my insider's view of Mormon origins is about, is, a, is a, taking a look at the four foundational visions of the church, the, the eight witnesses, the priesthood restoration, the angel gold plate story, and the first vision. And all of those, uh, they escalate with a telling by uh, Joseph Smith. And then the Book of Mormon is the first half of the book. And the four visions are the second half of the book. Uh, and uh, I found that, uh, much to my consternation, that uh, the Book of Mormon was, I think, Joseph Smith's novel. He had written it himself from the sources that were available to him in, in the 19th century. Now, that ties into <clears throat> to your article because in the same way that sort of the popular story, that there was one story from the beginning about Joseph Smith's visions and things like this, the, the church keeps changing its story in terms of polygamy, doesn't it? Well, I think they have. It's, uh, they've really never been uh, totally up front with whatever they've had to say about polygamy from the very beginning. I don't, either to, they, the leadership hasn't really been up front with the Mormon people or the media, and you can go right back to Joseph Smith and begin to see that. I mean, he, in, in 1844, he said, uh, I've been accused of polygamy, but uh, uh, I can, I've been accused of having seven wives, but I can only find one, Emma. Yeah. And at the time, he had like 33 wives when and, he made this statement. And even the LDS Church admits that today. Today they do, yes. And that's actually in Joseph Smith's history. It's, not, it's not something someone thought they heard somewhere. <laughs> that's right. It's in the history of the church. So, but... They haven't been very forthcoming with, with uh, what they've had to tell the, the, the Mormon people, and that, that comes right down to the Nauvoo Expositor. Uh, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, William Law and uh, a few others published this, uh, this newspaper, and uh, it, it talked all about Joseph Smith's polygamy and his uh, marrying uh, young uh, girls and uh, married women. And it was uh, declared a nuisance and libelous and was destroyed, and that was the trigger that led to his death. But today, uh, William Law uh, is, hasn't said anything more in that uh, four-page, uh, uh, one-issue newspaper than, uh, uh, than the church essay that just came out about three weeks ago. So he's, I don't know how they can regard him as an anti-Mormon anymore because he, uh, 
he just printed what, uh, what today they would acknowledge, but did not then. Right, and Joseph Smith was the one who ordered that as mayor of, of Nauvoo, didn't he? Yes, that's correct. And it, it just comes down, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's Wilford Woodruff and the manifesto. Uh, Michael Quinn published a, a big article in Dialogue magazine, 110 pages on polygamy between the manifestos. That's between 1890 and 1904. I think they owe him an apology, they owe Fon Brody an apology, but the word sorry doesn't seem to be in the LDS vocabulary, at least I have, I have not heard them use that word. Now the, the LDS church, you, you alluded to the fact that what law revealed is now admitted that Joseph Smith was, was practicing polygamy, but the church actually publicly denied it up until, what, 1852? and then even in some places. Publicly announced in 1852 after they came to Utah. And uh, the section on polygamy, or on marriage, I guess, was in the 1835 section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, it went in the 1835 edition and stayed there until 1876. And then they put the current section on marriage, which is 132 in the current Doctrine and Covenants, which is all about polygamy. Now, the original section 101 from 1835, it says that the church has been accused of fornication and polygamy, mm -hmm. and so they want to make clear, they believe that a woman should have but one uh, husband, and a man should have one wife. That's what it says in the, up until 1876, and it's just long time to leave that in, in as much as they announced in 1852 that they're practicing polygamy yeah, John publicly. Taylor, John Taylor actually in 1850 pointed to section 101 to dismiss claims of polygamy and yet had multiple wives at the time, didn't he? Well, that's what I'm saying. They haven't been very honest with the media and the, and the, uh, the Mormon people right on through on polygamy and I'm I'm sorry to say that uh, uh, I expected more from these recent two polygamy essays, which just came out three weeks ago, and it's it's uh, it's baby steps forward, it's progress, it's uh, it's to be cheered on, but it is only partially true. Once again, it's a long history of this. Now, even though it's only partially true and doesn't give a full picture of things, the what it does reveal comes as news for an awful lot of Latter-day Saints, doesn't it? Especially in foreign countries. I mean, these essays are, are on the church uh, website, uh, lds.org, but you have to go down to gospel topics, and then they're kind of hard to find. And uh, they haven't put them in the Ensign magazine, the church's official magazine, nor have they translated them into any other language. So uh, it's, it's kind of hard for... Uh, people in foreign lands to, to get a hold of this stuff. I, I've heard from, uh, from a lot of Latter-day Saints over the years that polygamy uh, wasn't really practiced in Nauvoo, that it was, happened when they came across the, the uh, plains and people died along the way and there were all these widows and, you know, I, this, this has actually seemed to be a fairly popular idea, but Joseph Smith, now the LDS Church, is saying he had over 40 wives. That's what they're admitting to these days, and uh, it's the first time they've actually officially admitted it. That's, that's the news of the essay. But, yes, lots of, lots of silly arguments, really. There's uh, only 2% of the church practice it. Well, that's, that's true if you counted babies and 10-year-olds and, uh, and old people, but uh, about 25% of the eligible men practice polygamy while it was legal. And they use arguments, uh, all false arguments, uh, that there were more women than men. That's never true of the West. I'm a Western historian in, in one of my degrees. And uh, that was never uh, the case. They were always looking for women to bring them to uh, Utah, to convert them and bring them here. And often they wouldn't even tell them uh, that the church practiced polygamy until they got here. And, uh, and then they, they didn't have enough money to turn around and go, go back to England or Scandinavia. I want to focus a little on Joseph Smith and for a moment, but uh, I want to take a little bit of a break and invite you. We're having some technical difficulties, and so we don't have <clears throat> the possibility of having you call in live and be on the air, 
but there is a phone number if you would like to ask questions uh, you're free to call and we'll have your we'll read your question on the air and answer it uh, it's not our normal number it's uh, actually my cell number <laughs> sorry for the problem but uh, it's 801-755-3013 that's 801-755-3013 if you, if you have a question for Mr. Palmer uh, you can call in, pass that along, we'll read that on the air and, um, and then respond. So now Joseph Smith, in the Book of Mormon, denounces polygamy, correct? Yes. But Joseph Smith's uh, questionable actions with women go back even before the Book of Mormon, don't they? Yes, they start uh, in 1827 just shortly after he's married and he's accused uh, of sexual improprieties by about 10 women that I I have included in this article. Uh, it's called The Sexual Allegations Against Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Polygamy in Nauvoo. Uh, it's been submitted for publication. I haven't heard back yet whether it's going to be published, but uh, it's had a wide uh, read on the internet already. But yes, there, there's ten, 10 allegations between 27 uh, and uh, right, all, uh, right up until he died almost uh, by women. One of the stories that I've heard over the years as an example of the persecution of Joseph Smith in the LDS Church was him being tarred and feathered. But that was actually by some brothers who were accusing him of seducing their sister, wasn't it? Well, by Eli Johnson, uh, he was uh, an uncle to, uh, to young Miranda. Uh, and uh, in all fairness, the thrust of that, uh, that uh, incident, which occurred in, I think, 1831 or two in, in Kirtland, Ohio, was mainly over uh, uh, getting John Johnson, the, the father of Miranda Johnson, the, uh, to give their property into a common, uh, common law of consecration kind of thing. Uh, but that was the main issue. The, but Eli, was uh, he thought that Joseph had been making untoward advances towards his, his niece. And uh, Emma and Joseph Smith were staying in the Johnson home. And so we don't know if those... those uh, uh, those allegations are true. It is allegations, and frankly, we need more information on it. But what I found interesting, that the reason I put it in the one of one of the ten is because he, uh, they, the, the the small mob decided to get the services of a doctor, Dennison, and uh, to castrate Joseph Smith, and they went and did it in the middle of the night. That sounds like. They're aroused more by a, uh, a crime of passion than a property grab to me. So the fact they had procured his services in advance, it doesn't prove anything. I think we need more information on that one. But, but the, the whole point of the first part of this paper is that here he's being accused by, uh, by uh, 10 women of, of untoward uh, advances, or he's being accused by 10 individuals uh, in a 14-year uh, period in uh, four, maybe five different states, possibly New York, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, so Pennsylvania also. And, you know, let me qualify. The, the reason this is important is because it sets a pattern for what even the LDS Church is now admitting, mm -hmm. that uh, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but at least let's touch on it. When the LDS Church issues the statement that they believe that a woman should have but one hu husband and a man should have one wife, I, I understand that there was a bit of legalese there with sort of a wink and a nod that it doesn't say that a man should have but one wife. And so this is their sort of lying for the Lord kind of thing. that They're not really lying, um, but they're just purposely misleading and yet they weren't even keeping 
uh, the first part that's unambiguous. Joseph was actually marrying the wives of men who were still alive, wasn't it? Wasn't he? Yeah, at least eleven of them, and another five or six, uh, another eight women we know turned him down, and half of those were already married to living husbands. Um, someone, uh, someone called in with the question: Is Mr. Palmer a saved, born-again Christian now, or what are his beliefs now that he has left Mormonism? Uh, I'm a Christian. Uh, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, I ri I've written a book about him, uh, of, which reveals my beliefs. It's called The Incomparable Jesus. You can get it at Amazon. Okay. I'd suggest you take a look at that if you want to. If you'd like to call in with any questions, uh, the phone number again for this evening only is 801-755-3013. Uh, I think you can probably also text to that if you, if you have a question. So there's this, once again, I just want to give sort of a, an overall picture. Joseph Smith, we know, tells uh, one 16-year-old girl that an angel with a flaming sword has threatened to kill him if, uh, he doesn't, if, if she doesn't marry him. Uh, isn't that? Well, he told two, uh, two married women that who already had husbands that were living, uh, Zina Huntington Jacobs. Uh, he told her that, and he also <coughs> told Mary Rollins Leitner that. And, uh, and Zina just felt like she, did, she couldn't carry that burden, so she married Joseph. Let's, um, so let's back up. There, there are a number of allegations before Joseph is known to start practicing polygamy. Yep. But w when does he actually begin polygamy? Well, I think he begins it with the Louisa Beeman when he marries her in April 5th, 1841. The church is now saying in their essay that he started as early as uh, 1833, four or five with uh, Fanny Alger, but there's, there's a lack of documentation. Uh, there's, there's no ordinance of the uh, record, there's no witness, there's no ceremony, there's, uh, and, and perhaps most important, the sealing power was not revealed to Joseph Smith uh, by the church's own admission until April 3rd, 1836 in the Kirtland Temple. So he doesn't have sealing powers, but there's no ceremony. It's illegal in the state of, of uh, Ohio, it's illegal in the state of uh, Missouri, it's illegal in the state of Illinois, and yet he's, he's doing these things. Yeah, the, the LDS Church makes a big deal of the fact that they have to obey the laws of the land. Yeah, it's an article of faith. Uh, right, and yet, and so that's the reason that they can't allow the Kingstons and, and the other groups uh, that are still practicing polygamy in the LDS Church, and yet not only is it no longer illegal in the state of Utah, uh, for polygamy, but according to the federal courts, but also uh, they weren't following the law under Joseph Smith, were they? They were never following the law of the land, not in uh, New York. Well, he didn't practice polygamy in New York. Uh, uh, in Ohio, Missouri, uh, Illinois. Illinois specifically had laws against. Yes. And not just polygamy per se, but fornication, adultery, and, and you know, whatever, whatever, whatever form they would want to try to, to bring it in under, they were violating that law. Mm -hmm. so, so let's go back to Fanny Alger uh, before we, we come forward to the, the LDS Church admits that Fanny Alger was a polygamous wife. Of well, they're Joseph. saying that she is because the alternative is adultery. So they prefer to have it as a marriage, but I, I just don't think there's any evidence uh, that uh, that, that it was a marriage. In fact, the church, uh, uh, there's, there's just no evidence that she was in that category. Uh, there's no marriage sealing ceremony, a record of the ordinance, a witness, witness was not present. There's no test of a revelation permitting polygamous marriage. Joseph Smith may have talked about polygamy in Kirtland, 
but there is no evidence that he practiced it until April 5th, 1841 in Nauvoo. And the LDS Church believes that Joseph Smith received the keys to seal couples for eternity on April 3rd, 1836, not before. And then Fanny Alger left the state and quickly rejected counsel by marrying a non-LDS person in, in, uh, uh, in Indiana, something you would not expect from a plural wife. So I, I think the evidence is really thin there, but uh, I think they, they prefer to say that she was his plural, first plural wife, because the alternative is adultery. And Fanny Alger was actually what helped lead Calgary out of the church, wasn't it? That's what uh, broke up the friendship between uh, Associate President uh, Oliver Cowdery and, and uh, Joseph Smith. Associate President was h higher than a, a counselor in the First Presidency. In fact, after this incident, uh, Oliver Cowdery says, we, we have been one, now we are two. And uh, this is what caused him to disaffect. It also caused William Law to his other counselor in Nauvoo to leave, and also Sidney Rigdon when he made a move on Nancy Rigdon, his 17-year-old daughter. So polygamy was a big thing that caused an awful lot of problems within the first presidency of the, of the leadership of the church. I, I found it interesting that uh, the first, count, first counselor, Eyring, isn't it? Uh, or is yes. that his position? Hal Eyring. Uh, Hal Eyring. Uh, he was in, on the front page of the paper today. Uh, talking about how essential monogamy uh, is, and yet I've got a few quotes you uh, reminded me of here uh, I'd like to share. Unfortunately, we don't have a graphic, but uh, Apostle George A. Smith, part of the First Presidency, uh, back in Deseret News of April 16, 1856, he says, We breathe the free air. We have the best-looking men and handsomest women. And if they envy us our position, well, they may, for they are a poor, narrow-minded, pinch-back race of men who chain themselves down to the law of monogamy and live all their days under the dominion of one wife. They ought to be ashamed of such conduct and still the fouler channel which flows from their practices. Uh, Journal, Dis Journal of Discourses, um, Volume 11, Brigham Young says that the a uh, monogamic system has been, quote, a fruitful source of prostitution and whoredom throughout all the Christian uh, monogamatic cities of the old and new world. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Um, Things have changed yeah, the, in their view. And then the church's um, millennial star stated, uh, the one wife system not only degenerates the human family both physically and intellectually, but is, it is entirely incompatible with philosophical notions of immortality. It is a lure to temptation and has always proved a curse to a people. Wow. Strong stuff. And yet, monogamy is essential today. Yeah. Uh, it's this this and yet this is supposed to be the restored church. And they're supposed to have a living prophet who can uh, give them all the right answers about the fundamental important things of life. I mean, if, 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 being, if, if monogamy is so hostile back then, why is it essential now? <laughs> Well, like I say, it's, things change, and they have changed. You shared with me uh, a section from uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 128. Mm. And uh, I'd like to, to pull, I think we have a graphic on that. Um, so, uh, section 128 of Doctrine and Covenants. Now, the great and grand secret of the matter and the summum bonum of the whole uh, subject that is lying before us consist of obtaining the powers of the holy priesthood. For him to which these keys are given, there is no difficulty in obtaining a knowledge of facts in relation to the salvation of the children of men, both as well as the dead as for the living. Um, I'm, I'm curious your, your take on that in the light of what we're seeing well, here. Well, if people want to read that in their Doctrine and Covenants, it's, it's in there. and, and 
we just quoted 128 verse 11, but go back and read three or four. It's basically saying that we have the priesthood, the LDS Church has the priesthood of, uh, of, uh, of old, of, from Peter. You know, he can bind and seal on earth, he can do anything he want, and there's absolutely no difficulty finding out any, any information uh, for the living or the dead about, uh, about most anything. And, and that's kind of uh, an interesting statement in light of the conclusion of the recent essay by the church. Uh, I don't know if we have that graphic or not. Uh, I think we may have the conclusion of that. Do we, do we have that graphic? Uh, if you could pull that up. Church members no longer practice plural marriage. Consistent with Joseph Smith's teachings, the church permits a man whose wife has died to be sealed to another woman when he rem remarries. Moreover, members are permitted to perform ordinances on behalf of deceased men and women who married uh, more than once on earth, sealing them to all of the spouses to whom they were uh, legally married. Yes, and in that conclusion to their recent essay, which is on LDS.org, it says they no longer practice polygamy, but they have not repudiated the principle of polygamy. And then they give several examples right there. One of them is uh, if your wife dies that you've been sealed to in a temple, you can, the man at least, can go marry another woman. Or throughout history there's been men and women who've uh, married multiple times because they died when they were young. And uh, the temple work is done for all of those unions. If, if a woman has three husbands, they're all sealed to her. And, and if a man has five wives and none of them are sealed, they do proxy work and they seal them that way to, to you know, f to, to be together in the next world. But the question they haven't really asked is, while they've repudiated the practice in this life, what about the principle and the practice of it in the next life? And that's where they don't get into it in this essay. Is it required? Or is it optional? Because the first six presidents of the LDS Church, that's Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, and Joseph F. Smith said, it, if you want to get to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, you must, it is required that you practice polygamy. That's what the first six presidents have said. Now the church has changed the definition to just mean one wife and uh, one husband that are sealed in a temple. But that's not what the early leader said. And uh, I am a product of polygamy. My grandparents on one side were polygamous. And I, I knew my grandmother especially. She, she lived till 1975. And I asked her as a returned missionary once, I says, uh, why did you practice polygamy? She was the second wife. And she, she says, because we were promised that we would be guaranteed the top tier of the celestial kingdom. And I looked at her like, but I can do the same thing with one woman. And she didn't have an answer to that. And I wasn't a historian then, and I didn't know. Now I know why she answered that way. That's the way it used to be. That was a requirement. It wasn't optional. and. Uh, Many LDS and early church leaders all believed God and Christ were both polygamists, and you do what the file leader wants you to do, and the, the six, first six prophets say you must be a polygamist to get into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, something they're not saying right now. So once the law of the land is removed in the next world, does the principle return? Is it required or is it optional? And you noticed in that graphic, uh, of the conclusion of the of the polygamy paper, what they what the church said. Well, we'll sort this out in the next world. This will be. Uh, we'll just have to trust in God. But that's not what section 128 verse 11 is saying. It's saying there is no difficulty for he who holds all these keys, and that's the president of the church, which is today is uh, Thomas uh, Thomas uh, S. Monson, that he can ask any question pertaining to the salvation of the living or the dead, and there's no difficulty in getting an answer. It seems to me 
that there are many, many women in this, in the LDS Church who would like to know a definitive answer for that, and that may affect how they feel about the church in the future. I think we actually cut off the last part of that conclusion to that paper. Is it, uh, can we bring up the second half? The precise nature of these relationships in the next life is not known, and many family relationships will be sorted out in the life to come. Latter-day Saints are encouraged uh, to... Um, uh, I can't make out the uh, in our wise heavenly, tr tr trust. trust in our he wise heavenly Father, who loves His children, and um, does all things for their spiritual growth and salvation. Uh, quick question: Someone uh, someone called in. Were Smith's marriages symbolic for salvation purpose or purposes, or were they physically consummated? Uh, they were physically consummated, but you have to understand that this is the Victorian era, and a lot of these women didn't, they, they had a Victorian reserve. They didn't want to talk about what they had done in the bedroom, and, uh, and they didn't. And sometimes we just have poor records, but there's at least uh, 11, 13 of them that we know for certain, because they said so, that they had had physical uh, relationships, sexual relationships with Joseph Smith. It, it's in this paper. Yeah, and for people who want to read the paper, uh, this is uh, this can be found on mormonthink.com? Yes, just just go to mormonthink.com, put in homepage, it'll come up, or, if you, or Grant Palmer. If you want to just go to Google, put Grant Palmer homepage, it'll come right up, and then you go to the, to, to the website, uh, Mormon Think, and... Uh, Everything I've done the last 12 years is there, including this paper. I'm curious, were you aware, back when you were active LDS, were you aware that Joseph Smith had married other men's wives? At some point, I think I knew about several of them, but for some reason, it just didn't stick. It didn't register. I, I've heard some people try to say, well, these were just women who, after Joseph died, they were married for time, but they hadn't been sealed for eternity, and so they were sealed to Joseph, you know, just out of their yeah, the, love and devotion. Now, we have the documentation on, on a good number of these marriages. We, we know who performed the ceremony. We know who uh, the witnesses were. Uh, it's, and we know that he had a physical sexual relationship with them. So, no, and some of these girls are, are, uh, are young, you know. I think there's about 11 of them that were teenagers, and... Uh, it's, it's just kind of interesting how, how the church often uh, uh, teaches this way, that in the essay they say, well, he married one 14-year-old girl. Uh, well, they're 50% right on that fact. He actually married two. He married Nancy Winchester, who was 14, and Helen Mark Kimball, who was 14. So you have to go through this, and as you do, that's why I'm said at the outset, this, this is partially true. It's, it's a step forward. It really is uh, baby steps forward. But there's still much that is, is just simply not, not accurate. I mean, not only was she 14, and they say, well, it was, it was not against the law of the land. And that's technically true. But Joseph Smith, to marry a 14-year-old girl, that made him a polygamist. That was against the law of the land. And he's 38 years old, and she's 14, and he's a religious leader. And you need to understand that only uh, less than 1% of the 19, 1840 census had girls getting married at 14, and only 3 to 5% uh, age 15 to 17. So this is pretty unusual stuff. They just kind of just slide over this. They don't you know, they don't talk about it, they obfuscate, the partial truths. Sometimes it's just outright falsehoods. But uh, that's, that's what they've chosen to do this time. And all of these essays have similar kinds of uh, problems. Some are more honest than others. Uh, but this polygamy one has, uh, has some troubles. Joseph not only took other men's wives, and there were questions, at least for one of those wives, uh, she thought that her daughter was Joseph Smith, uh, didn't mm. she? I mean, they na named her Josephine. But no proof from the DNA, but look, th this is what gets me about some of the apologists. They, they say, well, he married her, but they didn't have sex. 
I don't know how they know that, number one, uh, especially when Josephine uh, or, or Patty Sessions Windsor or Patty Sessions Lyon, L-Y-O-N, tells her daughter that you are Joseph Smith's daughter. Well, I don't know if she is or not, but it certainly sounds like they had sex if she thought he, she, Josephine was her daughter and Joseph Smith. So, so they, they do these kind of uh, uh, things that, that confuse people. From an LDS perspective, to, to, I mean, it's horrible enough, I mean, it's cultic to take another man's wife while, um, and say, you know, if you really want to be godly, you're going to give me your wife. Um, some people try to say, well, that was just for eternity. But, I mean, and we, it's clear it's not just for eternity, but also well, for time. Time is part of eternity. But, but, but from an LDS perspective, even the ceiling for eternity, they just end up without a wife. You know, the, this, uh, the, 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 well, this will be sorted husband. out in the next world. That's what they're lumping all that in the conclusion. But, you know, from, from a Christian's point of view, uh, Joseph Smith, when he asks, uh, at what point does Joseph Smith break the Ten Commandments? The, the audience will, can decide for themselves. The Tenth Commandment says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. It's very clear. When he holds her hand, when he kisses her, when he goes further, when he marries her, when he has sex. I mean, what, at what point is he violating that commandment? And then, and then all these women that turn him down, he doesn't say anything if they just quietly don't do anything. But if they go public, he smears their character. And there's a big section in this paper on that. I mean, there's, there's eight or nine women that he smears their character because they went public and sa said that he made these advances towards them and they, they didn't appreciate it. So he smears the character. Now you're into the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And he just systematically is breaking this. Thou shalt not commit adultery, number seven. And uh, I don't know what you can call some of these uh, uh, relationships. Some of these, uh, they don't even claim to be wives of Joseph Smith. Uh, for example, Melissa Schindel, she's, uh, she's, uh, she just, uh, I think she's a concubine, that, which is a, a kind of a concubine, which is kind of like a wife for the night. And you find that in, in three or four of these women, a Lucinda Harris, uh, a Mrs. Fuller, uh, Sarah Pratt. He's asking her, not for marriage, but for, to be a concubine. I have the keys of Jacob of old, and Jacob had both wives and concubines, you see. One of the things that people will say is that, well, polygamy was practiced in the Old Testament. It was practiced, but it was never commanded. Uh, and Joseph says that it's a commandment and threatens Emma horribly if she doesn't su submit to it. But he also violates very specific Old Testament restrictions, marrying sisters and mothers and daughters and uh, They'll, they'll throw up uh, David as an example. David committed adultery too, mm -hmm. but David repented. Yeah. Joseph never repented, did he? To me, it's much more serious than that, though, because uh, I don't know of any prophet in the Old Testament, including Jesus, or any prophet in the New Testament that said that marriage was necessary to get to heaven. And when you read section 132 in the current Doctrine and Covenants, it says that whoever is, is, is uh, commanded to do this, they have to do it or they're damned. So Jesus, all the prophets say that marriage is not required for heaven. Joseph Smith says, yes, it is. Whether you think he's talking about polygamy or one wife in a ceiling, it's not necessary according to the Bible. And but but as you say, the Bible does not direct any one to practice polygamy. There's, there's no evidence in the Bible that God ever commanded or directed any prophet or king. And most of the time these were unfortunate uh, kings personal were, relationships. And kings were actually forbidden from multiplying wives yeah. in Deuteronomy.
And it's true, I think, uh, David inherited a couple of wives from, uh, from Saul, but these, these relationships didn't work out very well in the Old Testament. They, they weren't very successful. Now, Ra Rachel and Leah's um, difficulties carried over to their, to their children. So Joseph Smith says, well, I'm here to restore, I'm, this, I'm, I'm involved in the restoration of all things, uh, and yet there's no, it, it doesn't seem, it seems highly improbable to me that God would restore something that was a cultural uh, behavior, not a direct doctrine or commandment from God. Now, Joseph Smith believes it's a direct commandment of God, and he uses Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as examples, but there's no evidence well, for this. Well, in the same way that in the book of Abraham, he says God commanded him to lie. And we're told over and over that God is not a man, that he should lie. Yeah, God doesn't <laughs> do that. Yeah. But we have a question. Uh, since they didn't stop practicing polygamy after the first manifesto, did that jeopardize the legal standing of Utah as a state? Yes. Um, this, what, Utah became a state in 1896? Yeah. And uh, they were still practicing polygamy uh, up through 1904. My grandmother got married in 1903, and then after 1904, they, st they, they started getting serious about uh, disciplining people. But uh, even as late as uh, uh, 1914, Joseph F. Smith was, was only dis uh, disciplining the man, but I think after the second manifesto, maybe 1910 on, they started uh, excommunicating women that were practicing polygamy as well as the men. Were the, was there an expectation to put away the wife or was it just not to add any new wives after the, the, after the second manifesto? No new wives. My, my grandfather was called in in 1910 by Francis Lyman, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, and he says, have you taken any new wives? No. Well, you're a high counselor, but we're going to release you because we don't, we don't want any more questions. So they released him. Uh, so they started, but it took them a, it took them a while. But the question is, what? Uh, uh, did it, yeah, they weren't going to they weren't going to let uh, Utah become a state until they were sure that the the practice of polygamy was put to bed. But during that time of the double man, 1890, the first manifesto and the second manifesto. Half the Quorum of the Twelve took new wives, and uh, they were not being truthful to the media, to the government, <laughs> to the Mormon people, or to each other within the first presidency. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it was. Michael Quinn pointed that out, and that's one of the reasons they went after his membership. They didn't like that, but it's true. They owe him an apology. And you know, my, my grandmother, or my mother, always grew up thinking she was kind of on the shady side of things and uh, and the apostles would tell her that it was a gray area and this kind of thing but she always felt bad until she read Quinn's article and found out that well the, the apostles were doing this and then my mother felt a tremendous relief and I told Michael Quinn that and he says that's why I wrote the articles for mo for for uh, for people like your mother The, they've, they've never been forthcoming. They've never, you know, this is supposed to be something delivered by God. Yeah. And yet they, they, they lied about Fanny Alger. In those days they lied when they were clearly practicing polygamy. Burned it's the, all the way through. Bur, burned the press of the Nauvoo Expositor, 1844. Um, lied about it until 1852 when it was made public here in Utah. But... They still kept lying to people outside of Utah, didn't they? All the time. That even I, even the converts. Yeah, I mean, I, many I, converts I, didn't know that polygamy is practiced in the Utah Valley until they got here. I mean, I, I have read the story. Um, I can't think of the lady's name. Uh, tell it all. Um, Fanny Stenhouse. Fanny Stenhouse. Uh, you know, she was hearing these stories of polygamy, and. They were lying to her, even though it had been publicly admitted. They were lying to the to the converts 
in Britain and telling them, no, 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 no. It's all the it. way through. That's why I'm saying it to the media and to the Mormon people themselves. The leaders have never come clean. And this essay doesn't come clean either. But it is a step forward. It's a, it's a big step for them. But it's not just polygamy that's the problem. It's all of these issues, and, and you can read about them in Insider's View of Mormon Origins. I mean, the foundational claims of the church have all gone through uh, uh, some rather significant embellishments. Uh, the eight witnesses, the priesthood restoration, the, the first vision, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, and, and uh, DNA. It, it just goes on and on. And... Uh, I think what saddens me is uh, some of you, the audience will know who Jeremy Runnels is. He's, he's uh, become a, a friend of mine, uh, and uh, we've gone to lunch and uh, talked a few times. And uh, he, if you don't know him by name, you know him. He wrote the CES letter to an institute director. And uh, he, he did it in, in good faith and honesty. It, it, I think it's 82 pages. He's he, he said he essentially boiled down my book and, and then added some polygamy stuff into it. But uh, he honestly would like to know the answers, and the institute director said he would answer him, but he never did. And no one has answered him. Well, in the last three weeks, his state president, he lives, it doesn't matter where he lives, uh, has called him in twice and says, your membership is at risk for, for writing this, uh, this essay. And it's gone viral. It's gone everywhere. It's been very, very popular, and it's very convincing. And if, uh, I, I'd recommend to the audience that they take a look at it if you want to really know what happened in Mormon history. <clears throat> but my point here is that the stake president doesn't know about anything on these issues, and he's rather typical. And the church leadership at the top doesn't bother to inform these stake presidents and bishops, and they're holding church courts on people like Jeremy. I don't know if Jeremy's court is going to happen quite yet. I honestly don't know, but I know he's had two meetings with his state president. And, uh, and, and what I would say to, to uh, the uh, LDS people, this kind of problem is happening all over this church. And, and there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering and a lot of driving of wedges through families because the family thinks that that people like me or Jeremy or other, some of these other uh, historians have, uh, are out of the way, that there's something wrong with us. The problem is not us, folks. I'm telling you the truth. And if it hasn't happened in your family that someone has left over historical and foundational issues, they will. So what I would ask you tonight, if you're willing, when you get a chance, Please tell your bishops and stake presidents that if, since the church can't answer these problems on the foundational claims of the church, including a lot of the polygamy stuff, then to just leave writers alone. Don't excommunicate it. Don't hold church courts because they're framing the issue for these courts, not whether what, is, what we're saying is true or false. They're framing it as, well, your 82-page CES letter caused damage to faith. That's what they told me about my book, you see. And if they don't, if they can't answer it, and since they can't answer it, then it seems to me they should just leave us alone. Because well, I don't really think that God drives wedges through families. I don't think God's in an organization that does that. And that's what's happening, and they're sitting by and letting it happen, and nobody's doing anything about it. They just pick us off one by one. Well, let's... The reason that I focus on this is that Joseph Smith is claiming that he's a prophet who trumps everything in here. Yes. And when you started, when you, when you no longer were reading the Bible through the, uh, the set of glasses given to you by Joseph Smith and his successors, did you find the same God that you thought or that they were talking about before, an exalted man and one among many gods? And no, and two or three years ago, we had a session, and I talked about the Mormon Jesus and mm -hmm. the New Testament Jesus in there. We spent the whole hour on it, as I remember. Yeah, yeah and, 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 uh, it's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. If you will, the, the better answer is to go look at that, because I have quite a bit to say about that, yes. Quite a bit of difference there. The, the appeal we try to make to folks is that just because 
there's a counterfeit doesn't mean there's not a genuine. And yet, the experience I have had from most Latter-day Saints is they think that if, if, if they give up on Joseph, there's nothing else out there. Would you say that's a fair assessment of what... Most I, I would. I, I think uh, they just have, you know, they had such trust in Mormonism. And, uh, and when that crumbled, they just says, I'm not going to be duped again. And they don't take a serious look at uh, the New Testament. If they were hearing these same stories fr from um, a Jim Jones or David Koresh or something like that, they would be horrified that a man would claim to be a prophet of God and tell a man, uh, God's commanded that I take your wife, which is something nowhere you find anything like that in the Bible. No. Like I say, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's knife. That's number 10 in Exodus 20. Yeah, and, and not commit adultery and uh, all these other things. And yet, here's this guy who's taking his followers' wives. He's threatening these women uh, with death. I mean, can you share? We've only got a few minutes left. Um, can you share the what Joseph told Emma? And in terms of polygamy and the threats that she received if she did not submit. Well, it's right in the Doctrine and Covenants. If you want to read it, it's section 132, verse 51 through 4. And Emma did not know about Joseph's polygamy. He never bothered to tell her, except that she discovered him with a couple of these girls, the Miss Hill and Fanny Alger. Uh, she caught them in the barn. And uh, that's the first she knew about Fanny Alger, but she, they somehow got past that, but in, it was in June of uh, 43 when Joseph already had 21 wives is when she really found out that he was a polygamist. And so she says, well, if you can do it, I can too, and I, I would like your second counselor, William Law. <laughs> this what? is the most amazing first presidency in the LDS Church's history. In the early 40s, You've got, the, you've got the president of the church hits on the first counselor's wife. That's Sidney Rigdon's daughter, Nancy. He's hitting on the second counselor's wife uh, a little later on. And, and, uh, and then John Bennett is hitting on everyone using the name of Joseph. That's your first presidency. And then Joseph is, is hitting on... Like I said, the first counselor's wife, the second counselor's wife, and, and Emma, who's the head of the Relief Society for the whole church, she's, she wants the second counselor, William Law, for a substitute sex partner. Because Joseph can do it, so can I. And, that, and, and it's, that's what they're talking about in section 132, verse 51 through 54. And the very first line of that, verse 51, it says that, uh, that she is... Uh, that, that, that Joseph agrees, that we agree that this is okay. And then they go to William and Jane Law and they say, are you crazy? We're not doing this. And, and so then Joseph says, oh, I'm just testing you like Abraham. You can read it in the verse 52, 3, and 4 of 132. And, uh, and then Emma's just told, you're not to have any other husbands or any other sexual partners. You must accept polygamy. And if you don't do it, you're going to get destroyed. And if you look at her own comments, he, Joseph, she thought Joseph Smith was going to kill her. Well, according to Brigham Young, you, you have this fantasy Disney version of Emma and Joseph where sugar wouldn't melt in their mouths. But according to Brigham Young, Joseph Smith said that she was the damnedest liar in the world and there was no more wicked woman in the world than she and that she tried to poison him. Well, and see, in the and essay, he, he, it talks about how conference. wonderful their relationship is, and <laughs> we know she tried to get a divorce when she went in St. Louis, and there were 11 poisonings in Nauvoo between 39 and 46 when they left in February, and number 11 was Emma poisoning Joseph. And all, by the way, all those poisonings had to do with polygamy. They were either too eager to practice polygamy and they got poisoned, or they were too much against it and they... They, they got poisoned. And this wasn't just Brigham Young making an offhand comment. This was stated at general conference. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't, you can't go 100% with what Brigham always says, but the divorce was real, 
And I think she really did try to poison him because she, what do you do? You don't have social security. You don't have a, a, a woman just doesn't go out and get a job in the 1840s and uh, her parents are dead uh, up in uh, Pennsylvania. I mean, she's, she's an unhappy camper. Well, but, they, that, but that's not portrayed in the essay that came out three weeks ago. That's what I'm saying. Partial truth, some falsehood, some obfuscation, but it's, uh, it's all there. It's always been there, but they are say, making steps forward here, believe it or not. Do you agree with Jesus' statement, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free? Set you free, yes. Well, hey, uh, we're unfortunately out of time. Great privilege to have you with us, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks for show. inviting me. It's been our privilege to have with us uh, Mr. Grant Palmer, the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Uh, he has a new article at mormonthink.com on Joseph Smith. Uh, you can go there and read that. If you'd like more information uh, on him or uh, anything else, you can also give us a call at Christ Presbyterian Church, 801-969-7948, or go to our website, gospelutah.org. We invite you to worship with us at Christ Presbyterian Church Sunday mornings. Sunday School at 945, Worship at 11. Our address is 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Magna Main Street. Uh, we have simple reverent worship and biblical preaching. We have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian, that meets in Ogden at 3350 Harrison Boulevard at 9 a.m. As I said, for more information, go to our website, gospelutah.org, and we hope to have this on, the, on YouTube uh, in the next day or two. Till next week, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night. Yeah.